Hey YouTube, welcome back to my data structures and TypeScript series. In this video, we're going to go over the indexed binary heap. So as the name suggests, an indexed binary heap is a binary heap which allows us to index into the data structure. The indexed binary heap implements the index priority queue abstract data type. These are the operations that we have right now with our current existing implementation of a binary heap. We have logarithmic in queuing and dequeuing because of swimming and syncing. We have constant access to the min or max element because of our heap invariant, it's always gonna be at the top. But the method that, methods that require knowledge of where specific elements sit in our array, they take linear amount of time. So in the white is the, the time it takes right now for our current existing implementation. So advanced DQ, which is removing a specific element, takes linear time. Contains, which checks to see if a specific element is in our binary heap, takes linear amount of time as well. And increasing and decreasing the key also takes a linear amount of time because we have to find where that element sits in our array rep representation of the tree. With the index priority queue, we can get the orange times, which is logarithmic for advanced dequeuing, and then constant time access to contains and increasing and decreasing the key. And I made a mistake. Increasing and decreasing the key is actually logarithmic because we still have to sink or swim potentially. So it goes down to log logarithmic, it's not, it's not constant. So to give you more of a visualization, the, the real problem with binary heaps or the existing, our problem, the problem with our existing implementation is that binary heaps are represented with arrays. So methods like advanced DQ, which takes in an item, removes that item from the binary heap if it exists, and the contains method, which takes a specific element, item as well, and returns true if that binary, if that element is in our binary heap, they include a linear search because we have to search the array for the item to, to delete and we have to search the array to check if the element is in our data structure. So unfortunately these costs total up to O of n. So our goal is to achieve constant time contains and logarithmic advanced DQ as well as logarithmic increasing and decreasing the key. I forgot to put this here, sorry. What's the data structure commonly used which gives us constant time access? That is, of course, maps, hash maps. So what if we mapped our values, our actual values that we put in the binary heap to specific indices so we don't have to do our linear search? This is the solution we're looking for. This is called a position map. So let's see how this works. So let's in Q5, we're gonna push it onto our heap array. And then we're gonna add an extra step. We're gonna hold some sort of data structure, which is our position map, which is the mapping from values to indices. So because five is at the zeroth index of our heap array, we're gonna insert zero at the fifth index of the position map. Let's say we in Q3, we're gonna push it at the end of our heap array, but now the heap invariant is violated because three is less than five and this is a min heap. I forgot to tell you that, sorry. This is a min heap. So we're gonna swim three up. So we swim three up, our heap invariant is now satisfied. But now our position map is, as you can see, is not accurate. Three is not at one anymore and five is not at zero. So we're gonna, we have to swap this because we swapped the positions on our actual heap. And because our position maps, our position map is a data structure that captures the position of these values. It makes sense that when we swap the values, we have to also have to swap our, the recordings of the position. So we're gonna swap one and zero. And this makes sense now because three is at zero. So in the position map, the third index is the value of the third index is zero. And likewise for one and five. And now we're good. Let's in Q4. So we push it to the end of the heap array and the heap invariant holds because four is greater than its parent, which is three. So no swimming is required. So we don't have to do any swimming on the heap array and we don't have to do any swapping on our position map. Four is at the index two. So in our position map, we have the value two at the index four. If we in Q1, one's gonna swim up to the root of the tree and the position map looks like this after the swaps. And when we in Q2, it's gonna do some swimming up as well. And the position map looks like this. You can verify that this is correct. And lastly, when we in Q0, it's gonna also swim all the way up because it's the min smallest element of the heap and our position map looks like this. So let's verify this. Zero is at zero. So then at the zero index, we have the zero value. 
2, the value 2 is at 1. So at the second index of the position map, we have the value 1. 1 is at 2. So the position map 1, 2. 5, 3. 5, 3. 3, 4. 3, 4. 4, 5. 4, 5. So this is what we want. So now let's go back to our original problem. The first one being contains. Contains took a linear amount of work because we had to search our entire heap to check if something was in our binary heap. So let's say someone asks us if our binary heap contains five. We no longer have to search our entire heap because we have our position map. All we have to do is check to see if our position map has a value at the index five. So since the position map at the index five exists, then we can say yes, five is in our heap because it has a entry in our position map. So because this exists, we know that five is at some specific index of our heap data structure. In this particular instance, five is at the index three, but that doesn't matter for, that does not matter for contains. The only thing that matters is that this exists. And that means that there isn't, since there's an entry in the position map, that means it exists in our binary heap. And notice that this took constant time. All we had to do is index into the position map. Now let's go back to advanced DQ, which with our current implementation takes a linear amount of work. The current implementation on this line finds the element index first. So it does this dot heap dot find the index. And then it has a callback, which takes every value H in the heap and compares it. If it is equal to the element provided from the client and that equals zero, which means it's equal, then we're gonna return true and then the element index is going to return the index of h. So then after we find the element index, if it doesn't exist, it's going to be negative one. So we return false from the entire method. Otherwise, the element is the element index does exist in our heap. So we're going to call the this dot remove at helper and pass it in the specific index. This takes log n time because we potentially have to swim down the element that was replaced. So in this example, let's say we want to DQ3 we first have to find the specific index of where three is. Oh, great, now we know it's at four. So we pass four to the remove at method, which is going to do the swapping and then potentially swimming up. Again, since we're dequeuing a specific element, we have to do a linear search to find the index in O of n time, which is not great. So now considering our position map, we have constant access to our element. All we have to do is get access or index this.pm element. So if we wanted to DQ three, we're going to need to know the specific index of three. And we know it right here, it's four because of our position map. So then we can say, hey, remove that method, remove the value at the fourth index of our heap, and then it's going to do its magic. So we no, are no longer being dominated. The runtime of remove is no longer being dominated by element index. This is now constant. And now this line, this line right here is our the main work of this call, which is log n time because we potentially have to sink or swim the element that gets swapped with three. So this is the heap and position map that we've been working with for the past few slides. Do you notice anything about our heap values? So here are heap values. Do you notice anything about them? You'll notice that all of our values are greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to the length of the heap minus one. So here the values are in between zero and five. The length of the heap is six minus one is five. The reason why we need this is to keep our position map small. Imagine if we, we didn't have these sort of values. There is one, two, three, six values. Imagine we only had three values, one, 200, 5,000. Then our array would have a length of 5,000, right? Because that's the biggest, that's the largest element of the largest position that we have to keep track of, but we're only keeping track of three positions. So we have an array of length 5,000 to keep track of three positions, which doesn't, is not efficient at all. Here, it fits nicely because we have six elements, zero to five, and we limit them, we limit the values of these elements between zero and five, so then our position map is not huge. But now the problem is that what if we wanted to, you know, represent values outside of this range? I want negative five, I want 1,000. I also want maybe complex objects like some sort of hero or I don't know anything right some sort of object that's not a number so then how do I if I want to have an object then that means I can't index into into, into this position map because indices are numbers they're not complex objects so how do we solve this problem 
The problem is to let the numbers of the heap represent keys in a key value relationship. So these are no longer our values. Transform your entire thought of what these are. These are actually keys into your values. So we now hold another array, a third array, which is the final array, I promise, which maps keys to values. So here the indices are keys 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and our values are 3, 52, 46, 309, 108, 277. So then our heap data structure, these are no longer our raw values, these are our keys which represent the values. And you'll notice that our values, I've created them so that our heap is still a min heap. You can verify this. You can check that zero is the smallest element by looking to the values, right? And we see that the, the value at the zeroth index is three, which is the smallest value out of all of them. So transform your entire thought. These are no longer, heap is no longer storing our values. They're storing keys, which then map to values. So this is our lookup. And again, if you're a bit confused of why we don't just put these values directly in our heap, this is because if we do so, then imagine our position map. Our position map would have a length of 309 to store six elements, which is crazy. So we don't want that. And our values can be any generic type T that can be compared, right? They can be numbers, they can be strings, they can be complex objects. We're not limited by numbers anymore because we have our lookup map. Now, because our values are not limited anymore, we can easily increase and decrease our keys. And when I mean increase and decrease our keys, I don't really mean increase and decrease these raw keys. I mean increase and decrease the values associated with the keys. And this takes constant time. So let's say I wanted to decrease the key two, and I wanted to decrease it to this new value called T2 star. So here, the existing value of two, of the key two is T2. And now I update it to be T2 star. So before increase and decrease key was linear because we have to search the entire heap for the specific value that we wanted to increase or decrease and then update that value. But now we have a constant time lookup to where that value is. We're just gonna use the key to index into our value array. So that was the indexed priority queue. As a summary, the difference between the indexed priority queue and the regular priority queue is that we can index, we know the index of all of our values because we now introduce keys. And now that we have constant time access to the index of these values, these bottom four operations that took a linear amount of time are now reduced. So remove is now logarithmic because we just have to, we know the location of the key. Now all we have to do is remove it replace it with the last element, and then sync or swim the last element to satisfy the heap invariant. Contains now goes from linear to constant because we just check to see if the key that the client is asking the question contains, we're just gonna check to see if there's an entry in the position map. The position map itself is a data structure that tells the position of the key. So if there's an entry, then of course we know that it exists. Increase key, increase key and decrease key are now logarithmic, they're no longer linear because all we have to do is sync or swim the element. We already know where the, the value is because we have constant time access to the index. In regards to the differences of implementation details, going back to the previous slide, when we're syncing and swimming, we're gonna be moving these numbers. And because these numbers now have a specific position, we also have to be swapping our positions as well. When we're syncing and swimming our keys, we're gonna be, of course, swapping these keys in our heap. We now have a heap of keys. And because we now store this extra helper data structure, not data structure, but array, we now have to swap these positions whenever we're swapping the positions in the keys. These values never get swapped because we're not swapping values between the keys, but they can get changed when we increase or decrease the key. Or if we delete the key, then these values will be set to null. So that was the introduction of the index priority queue. And in the next video, we're going to go into the implementation details, which will clear up a lot of things for you guys. So I hope you guys enjoy, and I'll see you in the next video.